Hey everybody, I'm here to tell you about an experiment that I made up for you as a result of the whole coronavirus thing. You're not going to be able to be in the lab and I wanted something that you could do hands-on at home um, to explore some chemistry concepts. Um, so, you're going to do experiment number seven, your spectrophotometry experiment at home. Now a spectrophotometer is a little instrument, oh, they come in different sizes, the one we were going to use is a little instrument that you can actually take into the field. It's relatively portable. It's, uh, we use it with the lab quests from Vernier. Um, but those run a couple hundred dollars each, so I'm assuming most of us don't have them at home. I don't have one at home either. So I thought, um, I did some exploration and I found a, an app that you can use on your phone called Google Science Journal. And this is going to allow you to measure the intensity of light, which is all about what Beer's Law is about, okay? So essentially the concept is that um, as absorbance of a solution increases, the amount of molecules that are in there to absorb the light is also increasing. So I hope you watched the introduction video. I'm going to assume that you did. If you didn't, pause this and go back and do that. Um, so what we're going to do is you need some supplies. You're gonna to have to get these ahead of time, okay? Um, so I sent my husband to my local store, the convenience store at the corner, and I asked him to find some sports drinks. Now in your, in your original procedure, it said sports drinks. It did not say Gatorade. That's because it doesn't actually matter what brand you choose. The important thing is that you get one that has no carbonation. So don't get like a, a energy drink, okay? You're gonna look for something that is not carbonated. And then the other thing to look for is when you, when you look at the ingredients here, see if we can get the light to reflect well. When you look at these ingredients, you see that near the end of the ingredients list is always a food dye of some sort. So like, for example, the lemon lime Gatorade says yellow number five. Um, you wanna try to find one that only has one food dye in it. If you go for the red Gatorade, what is this flavor? Fruit punch Gatorade. Um, it actually has red 40 and caramel color in it. Fun fact about caramel color, it's, it comes from beaver excretions. Now we make it synthetically, but that's where the caramel color comes from. Most beverages have it in there, certainly like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, those kind of dark beverages. The, their color comes from caramel exclusively. But they still put it in some fruit juices to, um, this has no fruit in it, it's not a fruit juice, it's a sports drink, but they still put it in beverages to give it a different color. Um, try to avoid that, not just caramel color, but you really don't want to get a sports drink that has a mixture of dyes in it. You're looking to try and test just one dye at a time. Um, the blue is good for that. The blue has just blue number one in it. So just so you understand, these are named because the chemicals that make color in food are very, very big molecules. You're going to look them up um, for whatever color you choose, but they're very large. Um, we just name them as the color that they produce and a number. So blue number one is a particular molecule, okay? It's not the same as blue number two or blue number 10 or anything like that. Um, if you want to do red, it turns out my husband discovered that the Powerade is just red number 40. So if you wanted to analyze red, that's your, that's your go-to. Gatorade has caramel in it now. It didn't used to. We used to do that in lab with just the Gatorade. Okay, so um, when I did my initial experiment, I worked with the blue. This time I'm going to work with the yellow just to, to show you how I got to where I ended up with my procedure. And you're going to do a very similar process because you're measuring stuff that's going to be different from mine. Um, you're going to have to troubleshoot things a little bit, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and show you the other supplies you need. I'll show you how to use the app, and then it's your job to figure out exactly how you're going to measure, um, how you're going to answer a hypothesis. And a hypothesis is the same no matter which, which material you're using. It's always the idea that we can use standardization curve, which means a set of a set of solutions where I know the concentration of the dye to figure out the concentration of an unknown. In this case, the unknown is the Gatorade. Okay, so we don't know how much dye there is in there, but we can figure it out. Um, the way you're gonna figure it out is by using 
these McCormick um, food dyes. And the reason I'm asking you to get McCormick is because they told us what their concentrations are so we can use these as standards, okay? Um, they were very helpful with that. I am not endorsing McCormick in general or, you know, we're not funded by McCormick. This is just a company that I know you can find these easily in the grocery store, usually in the baking and spices area. Um, so, for example, what you want to do is you want to go find your sports drink, okay? And um, avoiding all people, social distancing is important. And read the label and see which kind of dye it has. And then you're going to go to the baking section and you're going to, you're going to read the label here and you can see, um, you can see the dyes. Yellow has um, just yellow number five in it, which is not the same as yellow number one, all right? Um, green is always a mixture, so maybe not choose a green drink. And this one, this particular package, blue is actually a mixture, which I didn't know when I first made it. You can also get these ones that are like neon. Um, for this one, if I, if I was gonna, if I was gonna do blue, the blue in here is actually just blue number one. So that would be a good choice to pair with this guy, okay? Or the red, is this is a red 30 red 3 and red 40 so if you find a beverage that has that mixture in it you could probably use the red from the neon package so you're going to want to kind of match them up if you can if it's not exactly the same mixture that's okay it's not the end of the world this will still work okay so the other things you're going to need is some kind of way to measure your water so i chose measuring cups if you have a kitchen scale that would work equally well um because you can go from grams to you know moles of water and figure it all out that way if you want to uh, it doesn't really matter uh, how you measure the water you just need to find something consistent um, the next thing that you might want it depends on the concentrations of your materials maybe you want a one cup to dilute your water to measure your water dilution with maybe you want a tablespoon okay it's going to depend on what you have so um, it's going to take a little bit of experimentation to figure that out. So what you're going to do is you need to also find a container, okay? So I went through a couple of different options, and the way to, to experiment with this, I'll show you how to use the app in a moment, is to really um, put them on the app, put it on your light sensor, and see if you can get consistent readings with nothing in your container. So first I tried um, like a medicine cup you would use, you know, to, I think this is for Zyrtec or something. Um, but a medicine cup because it had a clear and colorless bottom you can see that there's some imperfections in this thing there's um you know a recycling label and a little button thingy at the bottom you have to be able to position your um your light sensor so that those imperfections are not in your way that can be a little tricky so you have to play with it a little bit um, I also thought about shot glasses, but all of my shot glasses are colorful or they're frosted. So like this one isn't colorless clear glass. It's been frosted. You can do this by, well, it's not very safe, but you can do this by taking regular glass and putting base on it. It will look like this. Anyway, so um, I also tried like a, a glass storage container, but mine all have the Pyrex logo on the bottom. So that was interfering. It, it didn't work out. It does have to be small, small enough to fit on your phone. So the other problem I had with this guy is it, it's about the size of a, of a softball around. It was too big to fit on top of my phone where my sensor is. So I ended up finally settling on this spice jar. All right, and so it's just an empty spice jar that I had. It does have some stuff on the bottom, but what I did is I figured out where it is sort of the cleanest and I marked, um, I marked things so that I knew where to position the glass jar to get as as close to the same position as I could every time I measured it. Um, so you're gonna need a Sharpie to do that marking. Okay. Um, finally, you need some cups. I just used I just used some mugs for my kitchen because I have a lot of coffee mugs. Um, but any any kind of container will do plastic or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, this is just where I'm going to put in my one cup of water into each one, and then I'll drop the dye into there and mix it before I put it into my container, okay? Um, 
the last piece of, of the last material that you need is a Ziploc bag. And so what I did with this one is I wanted to protect my phone. This is optional. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be Ziploc, by the way. Mine's, mine's not. It's Walmart brand. But a zip top bag is handy because it protects your phone. I have a little crack in the top part of my phone, and I didn't want water to drip into it. So you just put your phone inside of this, and essentially what I did here is mark the position so that you can see I would put my phone along this line, and then the jar that I was using to measure goes along this line. And I'll show you how I do that, but it's important to see these markings here so you know what I mean. Okay. So first you have to download the app. I have a Motorola, so it's an Android phone, um, but it's called the Google Science Journal. It's totally free, so that's what you want to get. And um, this is what it looks like, okay? And so when I open it, the first thing you see is the screen with the green notebook. You click it, and then the actual um, sensor that you're going to use is the second button. I know this isn't focusing very well, but it's the second button. So it looks like a circle with a squiggly line through it. And then you swipe up to see the entire display. And so what we are seeing right now, once the camera focuses, is a display of something called Lux if you have an Android phone, or EV, which stands for exposure value, if you have an iPhone. All right. And so here, this is just, uh, it's moving around because I'm moving the phone and how much light is being exposed to is, is being tracked there. Okay. So the way to, tr to figure out where your sensor is, um, is you just take your finger, it's probably along the top of your phone. So you take your finger and you move it around until you see, well, try not to swipe. <laughs> you move it around until you see the light decrease pretty dramatically. So right there is my sensor. And I found that when I got a pretty bright flashlight and shined it on my phone, I could even see it as a little circle that's like not obvious, but is there. You might be able to see it in the camera a little bit. Okay, but it's, for me, it's right next to my speaker. Yours might be in a different place, but you just move your finger around the screen until you find it. Okay, so here's my process uh, that I ended up with. I'm going to walk you through the logic of how I got there um, by looking at my data here in a second. The first thing I tried, the, what I ended up doing is measuring one cup. It's not the first thing I tried. It was about the fourth experiment before I got this. So you should expect a little bit of trial and error, which is always part of science anyway. So I got my one cup, and I want to try to fill this consistently the same way each time. Okay, so that's tricky, but I try to fill it as full as I can. Oops. Um, and then I'm going to put it into my cup that I'm going to dilute with. If I were doing this for real, I would re-measure that water because I don't actually want um, to lose any when I, when I transfer it over. Okay, so... All we'll do for the first sample is we're going to just put water on there because we need to find out what the background is in the video that I had you guys watch. Before this one, it was called I-O or i not. So in other words, the intensity of light in the beginning with no dye in it is our starting point. Um, so, by the way, I told you before that the reason the reason I suggest using a plastic bag is so your phone doesn't get wet, just like mine did. So I'm going to show you how I did that. You don't have to do it that way if, if you feel pretty confident your phone is not going to be damaged, but this does have water in it, so it's kind of inevitable. Okay, so here's like my sample platform, right? So this outlines where my phone sits, and this outlines where the sample is going to go. And I just put my phone inside of the bag. And you can still, um, at least with mine, you can still, and my iPad, you can still operate it, okay? Um, so right now, just sitting here in my kitchen, I actually had to add more lighting in my kitchen. I don't have any windows and it's kind of dark, but I only have 35 Lux displayed on my 
screen. That's not very much. And if you started at 35, you would not be able to go low enough to get any significant data from it. You gotta have um, a light source in order to get, um, in order for it to get dimmer, essentially, you have to have a higher starting point. So I experimented, and you're gonna have to do this too, um, with different sources of light. And what I ended up doing is having an open window on a relatively cloudy day, which got me up to like about 250 lux. And then I also uh, used a table lamp, so you can see it here. Um, and so you can position this uh, what works for me was anything over like 500 lux is pretty good as a starting point. You're going to want to record what your actual starting point is with nothing on it because if I go and try to do my data and then I try, I realize something is messed up and I have to go try it again, I need to know where to start. I need that light to be relatively consistent from one time to the next. So what I've done here is it has enabled me to get a very steady reading of 613 lux, all right? And you can see that if I put my hand in front of it, it suddenly decreases, okay? So that's how you find the sensor, okay? So 613 is pretty reproducible as long as I don't move it, but the second I move this phone, see how it changes very quickly just from getting farther from the light, okay? So we'll put everything back. Try to get back. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty stable. 619 is pretty good. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is I got to put the glass jar with nothing in it. And what I'm going to do is get a ruler. You can print them off the internet if you don't have one, but a measuring tape or a ruler. And measure from the bottom of your container on the inside up one centimeter and make a mark. That's important because as you saw in the video, the path length determines um, how absorbance is affected. In other words, if you have more molecules because I filled it up farther, then it's going to absorb more even if the concentration is not different. So we want to try to get the same height every single time. And so I did that by making a mark. This mark also tells me where to position the jar so that all the junk that's on the bottom is not interfering with my reading. Okay, so we're pretty stable there. I write that number down and then I put the jar on so that um, so that it's facing the correct direction and I wait until it stabilizes. So this is just your jar by itself, uh, absorbs some light. Even though it doesn't have a color, it's still absorbing light. So now we're at 404 lux, um, so we went down like about 200. That's pretty normal. So what I'm gonna do now is fill up to my line on my jar or whatever container you find. I'm gonna fill it right up to the line. And remember to put the container down and, and look at it at eye level, okay? Don't just hold it up and assume you're gonna get it right. You were seeing my hand there. So I'm gonna pull my hand away and I'm gonna let it stabilize and I would write down 384 lux for this particular setup right now, okay? That's our IO, so I would enter that into my data table. Then I'm gonna dump that out I'm going to dump it out. This is handy to do in the kitchen because um, you're going to have to rinse a few times. Here is going to be my dilution solution <laughs> that rhymes. Somebody read a YouTube or a TikTok or something. Um, a song. So I just, this is the one cup of water I measured earlier and then I'm going to take my, my dye and I'm going to drip one drop in. Um, I'll compute the, the concentration of that later, uh, but right now I just need to know how many drops. So I record that as my second sample. Um, it's important when you drop that you go completely upside down like this. You don't want, you don't want to be kind of tilted because the drop size will be random. Okay, you want to be completely upside down, completely vertical. And when you do that, the volume of it is going to be about 0 0.05 milliliters per drop. That's important. Okay, that's the same thing as saying that if I do 20 drops, that's worth one milliliter. Okay, so I'm gonna do one drop, holding it as vertically as I can, and then I'm gonna mix it. It's probably best to use something that was dry. Okay, so I'm gonna mix it, and now I'm gonna pour it into 
this container that, that we're using. You have to use the same container for every single measurement. If you change the container, you're changing too many variables and we won't get very stable readings at all. Um, so just like in experiment one, we know that you, you, can't just, um, you can't just dump the solution in and leave it at that. We know there's water in here because I just put it in there, dumped it out. So, and this, by the way, if you're using coffee mugs, don't do this over your floor. They don't pour very well, as it turns out. They drip. Um, and I made a lot of extra solutions. So what I'm going to do is just do a couple of rinses, at least two. That's your minimum, guys. Three is better. And that ensures that whatever was in there before isn't affecting my results. When you do a spectrophotometry experiment, it's really critical that you measure from the lowest concentration to the highest. So this is one drop, and my next dilution might be two drops into one cup. I would need to use a, a separate cup though. And then we get down here and we look at it and we make sure that it's eye level. At eye level, it matches the line. That doesn't, it's too much, okay? But you gotta put it down on the counter and actually measure, make sure that it is at the line. Don't just look at it from above. There we go, it's beautiful. And then you wanna kind of wipe off the container because I spilled everywhere, okay? Um, little droplets can interfere with our, our measurement, so we want to make sure that's clean. Okay, so I did move my phone on accident, so I got to reposition it till I get back to about six. Now it would probably be about six fifteen. So okay, there. Good. So I got it back in the right position. That's why you wrote down that first number. Um, Mm, it's a little bit off, there we go. So now I'm gonna put my jar in the position it's supposed to be in so that we don't have anything interfering with it. And we're gonna move our hands out of the way and then record the value, okay? So you keep doing that was 430. So you're gonna keep doing that. You're gonna keep doing that until you have obtained at least, camera's having a problem focusing. <laughs> uh, you're gonna keep doing that until you've obtained at least four or five data points for your standardization curve. Then you're gonna measure your Gatorade. If your Gatorade is within the range of that data, you're all set, you're ready to go do your calculations. If it's not, let's say it's the, the Lux value you measure is too high, then you need to make solutions that are more diluted. So maybe you do two cups of water with one drop or three cups of water with one drop, something like that. If the lux value is too low, then that means you need um, a higher concentration. So you would do maybe like, if you've already tried three drops, try four drops, see how it works, okay? So let me show you my process and the data that I went through so you understand the logic and hopefully it helps you to figure out what steps to take in figuring out your own procedure. Okay, everybody, so I'm gonna show you now my data, uh, which I recorded in Excel. You don't necessarily have to do that. I just found it helpful because I could program it to calculate um, my concentration quickly and absorbance so I could plot a graph as I was making my dilutions. And so essentially what, you, what I did is first I needed to know what kind of light source would work for this. So I tried just my ambient light, meaning just the room's lights that I had in my dining room. And it turned out that I started out at 114 lux, which is pretty low. Um, so when I did my dilutions, what I noticed is when I plotted this, it wasn't a linear change. It was a little flatter than that, and it kind of plateaued. Um, that tells me that I, I didn't have enough light. So I tried to, uh, the same measurements with a flashlight that I have and the flashlight was too bright 33,000 lux was way too high and it just read 33,000 for every single measurement so that tells me I needed a slightly brighter light but um, not not a big uh, LED flashlight like I tried to use um, in that experiment I also did a dilution with one tablespoon of water for one drop two drops and three drops so it was one tablespoon of water with one drop, two drops, and three drops. And, and 
that this part of the experiment with the ambient light, because it plateaued, it told me that I probably didn't have enough light and also my concentrations were pretty high. Um, once you get to the top part of the, of the of standardization curve, it flattens out when things are too dark. So that was the problem I was having. Um, so in my second experiment, I tried ambient light, but with uh, more diluted samples. So I did three tablespoons of water for every drop, uh, for zero drops, one drop, and two drops of dye. And I got slightly better results, but my absorbance calculated um, to be over one. And that is not a great place to be. Usually, generally, the rule is that you want to be between zero and one because absorbance is the opposite of transmittance and transmittance, um, you can't have something transmit more than 100% of light and you can't have it absorb more than 100% of light either. That's illogical. So we try to go from zero to one, which is the decimal value of percentage. So at any rate, the way to calculate this is actually pretty straightforward. Um, it's just your initial measurement. So in other words, with no dye, but with the water and the jar, um, divided by your measurement for that dilution. And that gives you a ratio between I and I0, I naught. And then you take that and you do the log of that equation. Okay, and so that's how you calculate absorbance. Um, the prior video should walk you through a little bit more of the theory for that. Um, so I did that and I saw that it was pretty high to begin with and then it got above one, so I needed, I needed to dilute it even more. Um, so my next option was one cup of water with one, two, and three drops. And I measured it and it looked pretty good, but it started to not be as linear um, right around here because we got below about 100 lux. And it seems like um, that, that below that level seemed to have a lot of what we call noise. In other words, if I took the same measurement multiple times, it would fluctuate too much. Uh, so I realized that 100 lux seemed to be the cutoff for my setup. That might vary for you. And if you have an iPhone, it'll be an EV anyway, and there's probably not a real direct conversion between those. Um, well, there is, but you don't need to worry about it. At any rate, um, so I realized because this was flattening out again that I probably needed a brighter light um, to get a better range. So the final setup that I came up with was a, a table lamp that has a 1K LED light bulb in it. Um, use what you have, right? Don't go out and buy this, but find a relatively dim lamp or a situation where you can move the phone um, away. I started in the 700 range with nothing on there and about the 600 range once I put the jar on there. That worked pretty well because my lowest one, even with a um, five drops, so relatively concentrated, was still around 300 here. Okay, so I ended up taking more measurements and I discovered, initially I just did drops one through five, and then I discovered that four and five were not very good measurements. They were flattening out, not because I didn't have enough light, but because there was just too much dye there. In other words, the instrument could not tell the difference between four and five drops. Um, so I could tell that because when I was looking at my data, the first four were very linear, pretty linear anyway. This one I think I messed up the dilution on. So if I were gonna submit this for a report, I would just redo the third measurement. Um, but anyway, so I did initially one drop, two drops, three drops, and then four and five, you can see, don't follow the trend correctly. So this tells me that either I didn't have enough light, which I had already fixed, or I have too much dye. And so, the next question I had was, how does this compare with the Gatorade? So then I measured the Gatorade and I found out it was somewhere down in this region. Okay, so I don't need four and five anyway. Um, but I do need at least four data points. So one drop, two drop, three drops wasn't gonna cut it. Then I used two cups of water with one drop, which is effectively like putting a half a drop in one cup. And by doing that, I was able to get a pretty decent calibration curve. I could improve this though by like redoing this measurement. You can see this one deviates the most from the line. So if I were doing this for real as a scientific experiment rather than just method development, I would have, I would have remade this more carefully. 
uh, it was probably, um, I probably put too much water in when I measured my one cup. Um, so we end up with a nice curve. Uh, I look at this R squared value, the correlation coefficient. The closer to one this is, the better off your experiment is. So if I'm not close to one, 0.975 is pretty far. Um, I'll keep working on it, keep refining my procedure and keep taking measurements until I can get a nice um, linear curve. Okay, other considerations that might cause it to be nonlinear, I, I looked at the label again and I realized that the dye that I chose for my standards actually has some red mixed in with it and that might be interfering with the signal because we're not able to choose a specific wavelength. If you were doing this with our spectrophotometers from the lab, you can tell it what wavelength to measure at. You would measure at lambda max. Um, we can't do that with this because we're just measuring total intensity. So that's a limitation that, that might be a struggle. Um, you can eliminate some of those by trying to just choose one dye at a time um, and, and being very careful about how you do your, your volumes. If you have a scale at home, it would be more reproducible to measure mass than it is to measure volume usually in the home, because you can just weigh the same amount every time. Um, and then you'll need to find density of your material, of your water at that temperature in order to figure out how to convert it back to liters. But if you have a scale, I would recommend it. Um, I'm assuming not everybody does. So hopefully you have measuring cups and stuff like that. Okay. Um, I really hope this works out for you. It was exciting to develop this and um, I think sitting in front of the computer is not as interesting as coming up with your own experiment. And so the idea here is you're gonna do some trial and error. You're gonna figure out what works for you and then you need to write down a short description of your procedure. You wanna include things like brand of um, your dye, which ingredient it is like red number 40 or blue number one um, and the brand of drink that you analyzed. And so um, hopefully you like this. If you have any issues or questions, please reach out. You can reach me at amiller at mvcc.edu.